Thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks uh, to the organizers for, for this opportunity to talk about Canary Can in this really nice workshop, beautiful workshop. Uh, of course, I do it uh, on behalf of, of a larger team of engineers and scientists that have been involved in, in the Canary Can along the long, many years already. Just a quick introduction of what GTC is uh, for those that, who are not familiar. This is an initiative of the IAC, of the Instituto Estatística de Canarias, and it's basically funded mainly by Spain, 90%. Uh, the other 10% is uh, by Mexico, two institutions there, and the University of Florida, with a, a barring uh, share in the, in, the partnership, uh, in the partnership. And we are in the process of defining the participation of China as a new member. And they are bringing a uh, high resolution photograph like uh, Espresso, and that's part of the, of the negotiation with the them. Um, construction started in 2000, first line in 2007, and the operation started in 2009. So we are a, an 11 years old uh, telescope right now. Grant Can is a company that builds, uh, that builds and operates the, and maintains and upgrades the telescope. I, I also wanted to say that we operate in a multi instrument queue mode. It's an important thing to keep in mind. And of course, we have a public archive. Um, it's also accessible from our webpage. Um, so anyone is, is welcome to, to look for any data there. Uh, it is located in La Palma. This is uh, the coordinates. Uh, an important thing is the elevation for thermal infrared. So we are at uh, 2,300 meters above sea level. And you can see the it's nice setup. Obviously, it's not the driest place, but uh, you will see that thermal infrared is still, still possible. This is a bit of the outline of, of the talk. Uh, I have changed it a little bit uh, since I was uh, seeing the discussions uh, in Slack and realizing that kind of kinds of, uh, an instrument that is going to be retired soon. So really going into the, uh, into the overview of the instrument was not so interesting. So I will focus on, on other aspects. So I will skip some slides and rush a little bit. Uh, I hope I, I will be able to keep the, the time. So by this time, I, I guess most of you know uh, what Canary Can is, uh, a, medium, a thermal infrared, medium infrared uh, camera and spectrograph. Uh, it also has a, a chronography capability, but this was not offered yet to the community. And um, one of the unique capabilities that have been discussed uh, this week was the polarimetric. And this is a unique thing and has really provided really, really, really nice results. Um, Obviously, the higher angular resolution that the GTC at the 10 meter aperture should provide. So, we are working near the refractory limit of, of the telescope. In terms of science, I will really be very quickly on here because we have talked about that already. Obviously, AGMs has a predominant uh, role in, in the science productivity of, of Canary Can. This is a, a slide I borrowed from Ramon and Alonso Rero a couple of years ago. Uh, but also we, we, we have a broader science. Uh, we went to rather different scales, spatial scales and time scales. So uh, in, the, in the superstellar field, we, we did some, some things. Obviously, we didn't have the high contrast imaging without the coronography. But uh, the team at the IEC did some studies and they got some results and really getting very deep in sensitivities, uh, near objects, so quite different uh, science topics. This is a really nice, uh, let me try to get the pointer. Okay, a really nice result. This was the first uh, ever uh, follow up, spectroscopic follow up of a supernova in the thermal infrared. So you could see the time of evolution and also the structure because you have the different optical depth of the, of the supernova evolved with time. So you can see from bottom to top uh, the time evolution uh, of the spectrum and how the different uh, species changes. Um, at last and not least, obviously polarimetry. Uh, this really beautiful result from Pat Roach, it was already discussed, but also spectropolarimetry. Enrique showed a few things. Uh, also, Anne San uh, from the University of Florida had did, did some studies on protoplanetary disks uh, in, with uh, spectropolarimetric mode. In terms of productivity, uh, we have uh, produced uh, some 43 papers so far with Canary Can. This is a small number. But we have to consider the, how many hours we have delivered, actually. Um, I will explain a little bit the context of that. Uh, but what I wanted to say here is that the, really the ratio of how many hours were needed to, to produce a paper with Canary Can was not that bad. It was actually very good. 
uh, in comparison with our average numbers here uh, for open time. So this really tells us that the can, was, I mean, there was not any problem with the data itself. So the quality was good. So they could really uh, get uh, science done from, from, the, from the data we delivered. Um, but obviously this is a small number that is what we, we have discussed, the, the size of the, of the community. I also compare this with other statistics and the ESO GTC large program was a very successful one. And there was part of this was uh, with Canary Can and the AGN led by Amudena Alonso Herrero, and they had very, very good productivity, obviously because they had the expertise and also they had to produce uh, their own pipeline. So I think this is an interesting uh, topic to discuss how to really get most from, from the data we, we, we provide. Uh, in terms of performance, let's just focus on sensitivities. Uh, this is something that a large aperture should provide. Um, I wanted to, well, these are the, the typical numbers that we quote, uh, one millijanski in SI2 filter. Uh, but to get this, we really need to do shift and add, which is something you, you can only do if you have a bright object. Uh, we have heard that this is not uncommon. But probably more dramatic in the GTC because uh, in the early days of Canary Can, we didn't have the, the fast guided functionality available for, for this sort of station. So we didn't have the fast tip tip correction. So you doing the shift and add, and we have to be in mind that this is just a stacking, uh, well, shifted, shifting and adding two seconds uh, in, of integration each, each safe set. So it's not really compensating the lack of fast guiding, but you gain some uh, additional stability by doing so. These are some estimates from real science programs. So this is uh, another slide I borrowed from, from Almudena with their estimation of sensitivity from longer integration, uh, uh, fainter objects, and even extended objects. So it's consistent with, uh, with our previous estimations. All this is uh, in the exposure time calculator. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say it's consistent. Obviously there's some variability depending on the conditions, et cetera. So when we talk about sensitivity, obviously PWV is a key parameter. Um, we are well aware of that. I wanted to say that the early days of Canary Can, uh, we didn't have a, a water vapor monitor. Um, then we got one, but it was really not well calibrated. So this was a study uh, done later by uh, Perez Fordan, uh, who really got the correct calibration of the, of the water vapor monitor and cross uh, that information with the uh, sensitivity estimates and produce this, uh, this master thesis, which is available on, on our webpage. And these are some of the variability that you see in certain, especially in certain filters, uh, depending on the, on the water vapor content atmosphere. Some statistics for the observatory, this is a two years old uh, graph, but uh, you can see the seasonal trend, obviously, uh, not really nice in summer, but we really get down to acceptable values in, in winter, and these are the statistics. So we have 25% of the time below uh, two millimeter. We show a bit more about that. But what I really wanted to say here is how useful uh, <coughs> this tool of the forecasting. The, the IC did a great job in doing the calibration of the monitor with uh, sound, uh, radio sounding, and they got into a bigger network so they could really do forecasting for the precipitation of water vapor. And it works really well. So uh, we can really do flexible scheduling when we see that in, in a three days time, we are going to get a, a good window for, for the thermal infrared. And we use this to schedule the, the right astronomer to do it, and we prepare the plan for it. So it's really a useful tool. I think this is a must for an observatory like the Rocky Los Muchachos. In terms of the stability of the water vapor, is the uh, information that was provided by the Sky Quality Group uh, from the IEC. Uh, Basically, they claim that there's another factor is the stability. So these are uh, the probability of having at least two hours of uh, these conditions. So below two millimeters in winter time, we can be with this range, 40% probably, not very good in summer. If we want, if we really want the stability of this, of this uh, metric in six hours, okay, in six hours, obviously it's a bit lower, but still we, we see that it's doable. So considering the demand of the thermal infrared, uh, and the GTC is, uh, this allows us to really exploit Canary Can. Another factor for us when we talk about sensitivity, not all, it's the image quality, which is needed for the angular resolution, but also uh, to gain the sensitivity. So we have some uh, numbers uh, in the web page uh, comparing the stress ratio, uh, accumulation, shift and add. This was, uh, I think, good nights. 
some other experiments with different chopping profiles. And basically what we see the differences depending on the chopping and the gain that we get with the registration, with the registration canal. These are numbers I got from some science group. This is from Almudena, the ESO large, the large SOGPC program. Uh, this is the kind of the proof we have maximum statistics uh, with what we provided. And this is a plot from the exoplanet teams at the IEC on the sensitivity. This is peak sensitivity to the sigma in this case. Uh, let me say that our sensitivity values in our, in our web page are typically uh, five sigma half an hour. So this is a square root of two if you want if you want to compare those to the numbers provided by ESO for, for this year. But this is a different uh, different sensitivity estimation uh, for the program. We can really see that we really need to be below uh, 0.3 arc seconds of, of the proof width at maximum to really explore the sensitivity. Despite the, what I say that they didn't have uh, the fast TP correction, we still were able to do high angular resolution science. And this is a, a result that was already presented by Wendelin on, on Monday by Taha Labadi and Pantene. Uh, you we can really see that they resolved the PAH emission and the this, uh, whereas the thermal emission was not resolved. So it was possible because of the height of the aperture of the GPC. So, uh, we were doing science, but uh, we have to decommission Canary Can in April 2016, so just to make room uh, for Emil. Uh, this is a workhorse, near infrared multi audio spectrograph. It's a, it's a key instrument for GPC. Um, and I wanted to, to stress here what the demand instrumentation, what the demand instrumentation program we have at GPC with uh, seven instruments in the first decade, five of them in the, just in the last uh, few years. So it's been a very stressful time. So the demand is really heavy on, on our focus station on our staffing. Uh, you can see here the different instrument, the different locations. So we are also moving instrument from different from uh, focus station to other as, just to make room for for new instruments. And as long as we get new focus station available, you have to realize that we have several different types of focus station which are different. They have their own ANG, the acquisition guidance system, their own calibration system. Uh, their own instrument rotator. So we have to design uh, this uh, subsystem for the new focal station. So there's a lot of effort to be populating more and more instruments, uh, uh, providing more, more science capabilities. So this is what it looks like and the, and the time scales for this. So many instruments, can I can was here in NASMIR, but then to move to the, to the podcast, uh, which is a much uh, smaller uh, place to, to have Canary Can. So it was challenging, and I will talk about the staffing uh, a bit later. Okay, uh, the upgrade project. What the motivation was, the main motivation was to really be able to put it back on the telescope in a new focal station, but also we wanted to get rid of some technical problems that we experienced. So the main one after, well, it was easy to, to realize, but we did an analysis to prioritize uh, what the, the project would do. The, the, main, the main thing was to replace the cryo cooler. Uh, Canonical was delivered with a very good diking unit, but this model was completely discontinued. The company was purchased by another one, so there was no other alternative. But this unit was compatible in terms of specification and interfaces, but really it, was, it wasn't the same thing. So the performance was not the same. Uh, you can see the contaminant, uh, well, the debris produced by the wear of these of this, uh, seals, uh, but especially the, the reliability it was not robust. So we were needing maintenance every three, four months. So this is not affordable for a large observatory. Uh, we, we wanted to improve some other things that deal with obsolescence uh, because the electronics from, is from the mid nineties and bring some new science possibility with the birth mode, maybe chronography and maybe new filter for the James Webb. This is the, the work diagram structure, the early days when we thought about, the, about this project. So, this show many different interfaces that we have to deal with. This is the new cryo cooler, and we wanted to replace the controller, the old electronics, uh, with a smaller one, with a leech controller, which would allow us to do burst mode and also migrate to Linux and have a more modern uh, infrastructure there. But we had to discope many of the things uh, because of the timing. Uh, and we removed this work package, it was a big one, um, to integrate the software. 
the project constraints, as you know, uh, uh, infrared uh, detectors are considered emission. So we needed uh, the sport license uh, for Canary Can didn't allow us to share the documentation or you have grant access to any external party to, to Canary Can. So this was a constraint. What, who could really do the, the project, the limited resources and the time. We, the, the, the funding was delayed. So our uh, opportunity window was really, really small. So we had to do this coping. Um, we, so we decided to go with, with a sole source contract that in, in, the, in the form of a collaboration agreement, you know, the typical call for tender with the University of Florida, who is the original builder of Canary Can. Major risk uh, was a dis distributed work between UPC and the University of Florida on a remote system. So share interfaces, share responsibilities because of not having a contract with just deliver a, a turn, turnkey thing and the time frame. So we had to adopt some shortcuts. Um, and it was a risk and we accepted this. So we moved directly from a conceptual design to final design and realization altogether. Uh, but this brought some opportunity of collaboration with the uh, University of Florida. So the, the new cry cooler was very successful. So those who are familiar with Canary Can the history, uh, we realize how happy we were. We have been operating more than one year, travel free without needing any maintenance. So this is a big change and the performance is just great, really great. So we got rid of, of the main technical problem uh, from Canary Can. It was very successful. We have to, to design, build new uh, interfaces and deal with the, the smaller envelope that we have to avoid collision with the ANG arm here. So we did some modifications uh, here and there. And we also wanted to uh, have a new uh, chopper interface uh, to synchronize the, the data acquisition with the secondary chopper. So we prototyped a new system with a backup uh, PLC, which is a new standard for telescope control, um, to be able to receive any kind of signal from any kind of instrument to, and transform it to the signal that was really needed for the, for the secondary. Uh, they have some, uh, it worked well, but some delays because of the processing of the signal. So we ended up using just, uh, it was a uh, original idea, use a transceiver. Um, so it, it was more, more robust, but we had the flexibility. So whatever instrument we, we received, we, were, we would be able to actually adapt the interface with this uh, prototype, which is more flexible. Uh, this was also used to train new, uh, young engineers uh, with, the, uh, with to prototype new things uh, to remove obsolete components uh, on the telescope. Uh, this was a new system to remote uh, control, remote power control the, the instrument and do the thermal control of the cabinet within the GCS, with the telescope control system. Uh, by the way, this is how it looks like uh, when it was mounted on the fabric casting. So, um, the, one of the main issues with the, with the project was the time constraint and um, really the the, the new detector controller development took uh, longer than expected. So we un un underestimated the effort needed here and risk. So we went back on the telescope in September uh, last year. So even though we had a really nice, a nice controller working at the sweet point of the, of the detector, the translation to the new controller was not that easy. So we went on the telescope when the, still some issues were remaining. Basically, we didn't have the quadruple uh, sampling that we used to, to, to use with Canary Can 1. Uh, we did have some horizontal striping that we thought that was maybe uh, not so bad because uh, we would be photon limited uh, on the sky and the shallow well was not uh, really available, but that's not so much use. And then we discovered another problem when we went on the sky, but we went on the sky just to, to discover this because in the lab, you cannot really uh, measure everything that you need to, to see a detector artifact because you, we didn't have the, the test bench, the cryogenic test bench for this. So we went on the sky, um, we tested the bus mode, it worked uh, really nicely. Uh, the chopping knot worked well with the new interfaces, so everything was very smoothly. Uh, we, and we did have fast guiding, it was very nice. And we were shot noise dominated most for most of science case. And uh, with some post-processing technique, we could get rid of uh, some uh, leftover uh, patterns, but not for polarimetry. Uh, obviously, this is a key science for us. We also detected uh, some uh, linearity issue on the low uh, 
illumination range that was not being able to do in the, in the lab. So when we compare for the same uh, object with the old controller and the new controller, the signal of the sky, we really see that it's not linear and it was problematic here because you, you really lose a dynamic range. So this is a problematic for spectroscopy especially. So you, you could eventually correct for these things, but really the signal to noise would be uh, damaged here. So we decided to uh, an emergency uh, plan to put back the old electronics, uh, and, but, but we had to adapt it to fit in, in the smaller envelope. So even this, which is a simple concept to split the cabinet, the big cabinet in two, is tricky because you know, a detector electronics uh, tends to suffer from different noise uh, issues. So it was not that easy, but we it just, what I wanted to say, the concept we had in September, because we knew we were going on a sky, we maybe realized that it was not the right uh, configuration for science. Uh, we made the decision in October when we did the commissioning, uh, but we were able to complete the design and develop and build and integrate everything yes, by so December. Thank you. Okay, thanks. thanks a lot. And then we have uh, just in December, we did a quick recommissioning. So our priority was uh, polarimetry. So we wanted to check what the instrumental, instrumental polarization was. The, le the level was slightly higher. Uh, but we will see that later on we got better values after the cleaning of the tertiary mirror. Uh, one key thing was to measure the polarization, uh, the position angle of the instrumental polarization, since it is in a different focal station with a different configuration. But the good thing is that uh, we did the geometrical transformation for the, from the two stations. This is the old data, this is the plot with error bars, and these are the, the new uh, measurements that we got we really fit really nicely. So, Everything was working as expected. What I would like to do if we have more time for commissioning is to further analyze the, uh, the, the improvement uh, thanks to the, to the fast guiding functionality. Still, we, we got some measurements with the burst mode with the first controller. and We saw a 20% improvement in terms of image stability. I would like to, be, to also assess the sensitivity under different conditions and also further test the Lawrence Center workshop experiments. I will talk about this in a few minutes. This was the first science observation with the final setup of Canary Can with the old controller, but in the new focal station, the new tri cooler. And this is a really nice result. And it was shown uh, by Lay Fletcher, I think it was on Tuesday. I wanted to show that we can do science in the T-band. This is a unique filter that we had, and they claimed that it was really good data here. And um, uh, this is thanks to having really below one, mil one millimeter PWB. So the Lawrence Center workshop, uh, a couple of years ago, we came up with uh, knowing that uh, for, for the ELTs, it would be ideal to get rid of chopping and nodding. So we did a few tests of diff scanning. Obviously this is not a functionality, it was meant for the GPC, but, but we did experiment with the non-sidereal tracking and guiding. So we created a simulated uh, ephemeris file for, for a bright object to do the drift along uh, the channels and across them to see what, uh, how stable it is and what improvement we can, we can get in terms of different sensitivities, different rates, etc. So this, in this case, I'm just showing the stability of the centroids, uh, but there will be a poster, I think, uh, for the S5 uh, later this year with the sensitivity measurement that uh, posted by Park and Thomas Tijano and myself. And this brought a uh, possibility for other instruments as well. So we use this drift scanning thing for optical spectroscopy as well. And uh, regarding the background subtraction, um, we know that uh, there, is a, there was a nice talk uh, yesterday by Ioannis um, about the residuals. So we see here the three different pupils from Subaru, Canary Can and BC, uh, different configuration, how they can impact the, the background. So we took some uh, data like the, what the, what BC did uh, recently uh, to see what it depends on, how stable it is. Um, this is just some images after uh, 300 seconds. So it's not just a, a direct chop uh, subtracted image. So you have to really uh, accumulate the signal to, to, to see it on top of the chop noise. And this is the, the structure I would, I wanted to say, to show here because you, you were chopping different, changing the symmetry, you see different features. So this is a thing that suggests that 
there is there are preferential chopping directions maybe depending on, on your setup um okay i will skip here the future i know there is a question so i will talk about this uh, later on sorry we won't have thermal infrared uh, soon so just to, to finish here before the questions uh, conclusions and lesson learned you really need a robust instrument for the ELTs, uh, so you need to follow sp space industry standards. You need a large community behind the instrument to support it. Uh, cryogenic is challenging, not, maybe not so much uh, for the ELTs because they have gravity invariant configurations. Polarimetry will be challenging for the ELTs because of the optical uh, configuration with many reflections. Uh, image quality, of course, is a, is a mass. The background subtraction will continue to be a challenge. Um, and better detectors of the as needed. In terms of canary can, we know it's a unique thermal infrared spectral polarimeter, but it's going to be decommissioned in just a few weeks. Um, the main issue with canary can was the image quality initially and the cryo cooler. And the main problem with the, with the project was the small opportunity we made with it. So I think it's probably the time for questions. Um, Jean Philippe, uh, should I follow with the future? Question from, from Warren. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you very much for this uh, nice overview and, and the hard work behind that. Um, so I have, I have several, I mean, I have questions. Um, so I guess you, you started answering one of them uh, by Chris Packham, which is, can you comment on the lessons learned from the recommissioning run? Okay. Well, the recommission in itself, um, basically the time constraint was, uh, was a big issue for us. Uh, and I must say that the commissioning plan was probably not really well prepared and we have to adapt it uh, real time because of this, you know, changing uh, the controller, the, the new controller to the old one, it really messed things a, a little bit. Um, yeah, I think it, it was a project that was meant to start uh, much earlier to really be able to do this. Uh, so with this uh, time frame of less than a year, uh, it would be a different thing if, if we would start from, from scratch again. Okay, thank you, Sergio. There's a question by Enrique. Okay. How does the drift scanning and C2N sensitivity compare? Uh, we don't have those, those numbers yet. So, uh, this is something that if we Amirka are working on right now. So we don't have to estimate. I just focus on, we are able to do that and the stability of the centroid just to, because we were interested in using this technique for other instruments, well, just to show it was possible. We don't have any sensitivity. Uh, Jean-Philippe, may I answer the question of the future? Is yes, yes, please. Think? Yeah, so we know that uh, can I can, uh, well, as any other observatory, thermal infrared is just a small fraction of the, of, the, of the proposals and the time delivery is obviously also uh, small. So when the observatory has to make a decision, this is a key thing. And our community is really biased to the, to the optical. Uh, also, uh, our instrumentation program is really busy, challenging. And the reason why we are going to remove can I can is because we want to have IPCAN here right now, because we will have a gap here for the optica, because we have to move Osiris, which is our workhorse instrument, doing most of the science to a different focal station. So we need the optica now. So that's the main reason that we are now removing Canary Camp. And I also wanted to say, uh, Warren asked uh, about the strategical decisions for, for this. Um, I just wanted to say that with our staffing, we have eight support astronomers, and we have to do multi-instrument queue, which means taking the data, doing the quality assessment, evaluating the proposal, and all these things. So we have less than one FTE left on the support astronomer for anything else that is not operation. So that's very challenging to do commissioning <laughs> of new instruments, new modes, uh, and also the engineering team is, uh, is understaffed. So uh, all this information is in the webpage because of the transparency policies. Uh, these are governing bodies and how the decisions are made. There's a lot of information. I think we can talk about that offline, maybe, uh, Warren, if you wish. There are reports there. I wanted to say that the process for this next generation instrument was slightly different 
uh, was more open to the community. Initially, with the, the other generation, there was a panel, a review panel that would make suggestions. Um, so dr drove the, the process uh, in that regard. Now it's, it's more open to the community. And this was the, the, the suggested, the concept, the concept that we received. So you can see that there is nothing in the thermal infrared for the next generation. 